Manson Cast One. My name is Billy Reeves. Hi, I'm Paul Draper. But I'm Peter. Let's start at the end. Attack of the Grey Lantern is, has a new lease of life as a sumptuous reissue. What's your relationship with it, both of you, now? Me and Dub have been deep in the bowels of EMI's tape archive. We can't tell you where it is because we'd have to kill you. But um, And they have a security person with you all the time. And one of the most fascinating places you'd ever go to. I mean, literally, it's priceless. We, we dug them out from the archives, the original two-inch master tapes, and digitised them all. We also got half-inch masters and, and the instrumentals. And obviously, we, were, we went out on tour and did Attack the Grey Lantern. So, you know, it was worthwhile because I saw people screaming at a backwards frog sound off a Mellotron sample <laughs> that, that we had, so, that, we, that we recorded off those tapes from the EMI archives. So it, it was very, very much worth it, you know, doing it. And, and also... Dub has put a 5.1 stereo surround sound mix mm. of the album together for the first time, which was a phenomenal effort and fun and sounded sonically mm. incredible listening to it and this curation of the Manson catalogue, mm. I guess. So, Dub, what does Paul mean by those three things then? What does he mean by a two-inch master tape and a 5.1 surround sound. What do all those things so mean? So originally to... in the studio, I think you started in Par Street, didn't you? Yeah, originally, In Par yeah. Street, they yeah. record onto a two-inch tape machine, mm. um, which is an analogue machine, which we don't very, well, very rarely use these days. So the first protocol, really, for, for ease of us to get our hands on it, was to get it all off the tape and put into computer land. Some of the tapes are labelled right and some of them aren't. <laughs> the half-inch tape was the actual mixes of that, and also it was put onto DAT tapes as well, which are, uh, it's like half-size cassette, but it's mm. digital, same quality as CD. So trawl through all of those and work mm. out what's missing, what isn't. And it was almost like reverse engineering it. Start with mm. the Lantern album and I go, all right, that's how it finished up. And here's some of the constituent parts. Uh, let's retrace your steps. And so, and what's a 5.1 surround sound mix then? If you're mixing a track for a film, you'd put it stereo in the front left and right either side of the picture mm. and maybe a few effects or reverbs or i tend to go to take the attitude of like we've got five speakers let's use them okay. so if you sit in the middle you've got the best seat in the house and right. stuff's going on all around you now on gray lantern because that's already mixed 20 years ago you've got to kind of stay true to that but i will pull things out into three dimensions so You'll find things that are panned just in the rear speakers, the stuff in the middle, the vocals mm. in the centre. How did speakers. you decide what to put where then in that case? Because there wasn't a 5.1 quadraphonic sound remix no, of it. No, there wasn't, the but place. I've done it before. I've done a fair bit of it over the years. Mm. So you kind of just find a way of doing yeah. it. That Dub's suits been you. quite modest about this. He actually, yeah, I, thought he, I thought he was. He actually it. took the entirety of Bjork's catalogue and put it into 5.1 stereo surround sound. Okay, back to the beginning then, Paul. How much of a myth is it that the band were stumbled across in a crappy rehearsal room in Liverpool by an old school A&R man who said, on the spot, I'm going to sign these bums? Um, yeah, you know, that's that's pretty much what happened. I mean, um, we were in a warehouse in Liverpool, uh, which was just down a back alley called Crash Rehearsal Studios. Loads of bands would go there. You know, there was like mm. a uh, a bar and a cafe where bands mm. would hang out, you know, and, um, you know, there was like dead pigeons in the street outside. <laughs> and, you know, it was a bit rough and that, but we knew bands were went there and rehearsed and this was where we'd moved on from sitting around, around people's living rooms and strumming guitars and mm. dreaming. We actually then made a... Uh, you know, a move, which was a great move at the time to go and, you know, rehearse and do it regularly. Mm. And we said, we're going to do this every week, you know, and Sunday was our day, you know. Right. And, um, yeah, we would just go over and I'd, you know, I'd have always written songs and always forever getting bands together. And this was my latest thing. And I never, mm. you know, we, you know, you, you would always dream that you were going to get, you know, a record deal, the elusive record deal or what have you. And, we didn't really know there was an explosion in bands, you know. You didn't know at the time. It was just, you know, grunge had happened and next thing there was blur in the charts and what have you. And One day we got moved out of our regular room because someone more important was there and they put us in the studio above the bar 
I think the guy who owned the warehouse, Mark Davis, um, sort of popped his head in and just said, like, who writes your songs? I was like, me. And he's like, oh, he said, you know you're going to get a record deal, don't you? I don't know what he saw in us, but obviously mm. he saw something in us. So because he, did he tip the industry the wink then? He, he, he did. He, he, I, you know, obviously he must have seen so many bands come through that that mm. that, that what we had something. I don't know what it was, but he saw something in it and he called a very famous music industry guy called Alan Wills, who went on mm. to form Delta Sonic Records, signed the Coral and the Zootons and many things mm. and, and tragically died in, in, in an accident in Liverpool. But I remember Alan being a great guy, um, you know, very kind to us. You know, the music in- industry can be shark-infested waters mm. and, you know, he wasn't a shark was in the water. Was he a kind of like he local a... A&R guy then? Because I mean, Liverpool was, was, is such was... an important place for music. You've yeah. really got to know your... Yeah, onions. so Liverpool is one of the, not just nationally, but one of the, well, as you know, mm. one of the world hotbeds for music. Yeah. So Polygram Music, or Universal Music, as it's known now, had uh, some eyes and ears on the ground. But this is the pre-internet age, and that mm. was Alan Wills, and he was wow. a scout in Liverpool. And he sat on the drums, and he started drumming along with us mm. and asking us, like, what music we were into when we were growing up. And, you know, we were just sort of... Very, you know, taken aback by the whole thing, you know. And um, had you done a gig by that point? No, we probably thought we would start gigging in Chester and then maybe go to Liverpool. Mm. So yeah, um, Alan called up the chain of command at, at Universal, <laughs> which is now that you know the world's biggest record yeah. company and publisher. And, and um, so it's publishing first. Yeah, music publishing is buying the songs, basically the yeah. rights to the songs. Whereas recorded music is buying the rights to the recorded yeah. music. But people, you know, probably a layman doesn't understand. They just think record deal. So I always yeah. just say record deal. You know, what I mean, it's, that's what. That's just a technicality. You know, we got signed. You know, yeah. so um, yeah, Alan Wills, who who at that point, you know, had not done his Delta Sonic thing, but was just the eyes and the ears on the ground. Mm. He called up the chain of command mm. to the first port of call in London, which was Mark Lewis who now runs uh, Be Unique uh, Records and Publishing in London, who, I mean, massive acts, you know, um, deal with, like, James Bay and, you know, all sorts of mm-hmm. ma- mass- massive artists now. But Mark was uh, an a- A&R at Polygram, Island, Island Records, Island Publishing, mm-hmm. Polygram, which is now all universal. Mark came up and Mark was sort of less impressed with us, you know. He was, he was the... Uh, than Alan Wills was, but uh, he, you know, he sat down and he sort of had a little giggle. It was, yeah, you know, yeah, it's funny. And he was the guy with his, uh, you know, hands on the purse strings. I think we just, I think we just got on, you know, because yeah, because then an advance from the publishing house and an advance from the record company that means essentially you turn pro like that. Yeah, yeah, but to take that step from someone coming to watch you in a room to someone actually signing a check over is you know that's the magic moment of your life isn't it you know and uh, mark just incentivized us and said well i'll book you in a studio and he booked us in elevator studios in liverpool with ronnie stone just on a sunday and he said just record two tracks you know so it wasn't a great outlay for mark in uh, or universal music and mark was on a huge role of signing okay, what bands. Were the, what were the tracks you, did you do with Ronnie? We did uh, a B-side, Drastic Sturgeon, which was like a poppy one, which I thought, you know, wow, you know, he'll be dead into this. But he wasn't, he wasn't that interested in, because we, and, um, we, I did um, Naked Twister, which he loved, right. you know, and he was like, OK, if you can write songs like that, I'll hmm. sign you. Wait, did you have a name at that point? We, yeah, we were. We, I think no. We 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 become Manson at that point, but prior to that, we were called Grey Lantern. After sort of like hmm. after, I, th- I think it was like Pink Floyd, Floyd yeah. inspired, like a colour and a random word after it. You know, <laughs> yeah. so, as as was the you know as was how I thought the band would pan out. You know, and um, hmm. um, but I think we were told very early on by you know people coming into the you know you've got to be called one word it's all one word bands those days yeah of course yeah. we didn't know that we didn't know how the industry yeah. worked but it's M-A-N-S-O-N at that point it was at that point yeah until yeah. someone pointed out that you know um, I think we would uh, Charles Manson had copyrighted his name right. or something was that sort of like deliberately I was going to say offensive that's a bit of a modern way of putting it but was that, was that a sort of like deliberate attempt to yeah, get I, attention by having a controversial <laughs> name no I don't think we're that clever I think we were told I think I think <laughs> Mark Davis said to us, get a name that's edgy. Mm. 
Mm. And we went home and I think I was sitting at home and there was just a documentary of Charles yeah. Manson on TV that, that night. And it was like, OK, it's either Charles or Manson. You know? yeah. <laughs> Charles, Charles was a completely different group. Yeah. I think, well, yeah. Charlie, you know what I mean? It was it's like, funny, actually. <laughs> the, the, the duct tapes in the MI, when I pulled them out, they were spelt with an O. I've got the box set here and I'm looking through it and they've got the artwork from... There's bits of artwork here in it which you got the there, there it is straight away you know yeah. the the artwork with the with the, M the, and the Manson the, with because the because the change the changing of the spelling was actually even more publicity wasn't it yeah I, you know looking back in it, it we might have been just overthinking it so was there pressure for you first to have hits to mix tracks so they would sound good because this stuff was being played on daytime radio one uh, I don't know if there's pressure you put pressure on yourself to make stuff great some company, I mean the record company generally left you guys guys alone didn't it's they? a big record company it was it's a big label i know but you you'd have to understand the dynamics of what was going on at parlophone at yeah. that time well, that, that band they had were pretty big weren't they was it the, the beatles or something beatles yeah, yeah they were pretty big yeah, yeah. The, the, cold, the cold plays the radio heads i mean yeah you know so you know but, we, weren't, but, but, we, we weren't a big deal for them really in the no, bigger scheme yeah. of things so they signed us up par street was pretty cheap keith who was our a and r man at the time popped up and had a lesson and he you know he heard what the the origins of gray lantern and, and credit to him just Roll yeah. on, lads, you know, and, and, <laughs> and uh, you know, he was on a roll as an A&R man, you know, he was, he was working with radio, had Supergrass, met him. Was that something you wanted to do, though? Did you want to, you, Paul, did you want to be a pop star and have hit records? Um, no, I think re realistically I probably thought I could be a sound engineer if I really knuckled <laughs> wow. down. And I think I was told at school, you know, you have to be London, you have to be from London to be a sound engineer, but mm. you could be a cameraman for Welsh TV, it was the closest thing to a pop star. <laughs> That you're allowed at my school, you know. Right. They didn't. Was it, it wasn't. Was it in Wales then? Why Wales? Well, I moved from. I moved from Liverpool. I mean, it's only 15 miles from oh, Liverpool. Course, as the yeah, crow okay. flies, but I just moved literally <laughs> right, just on, right on the border between right, okay. England and, and Wales, outside of Chester, is where I grew up in a little town called Connors Quay on D side on the River Dee, and. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, you, you had these, uh, my God, I must have been 14. And by that point, I had like a four track at home and a, a Casio synth and a, a mm. Squire guitar. The whole, my mum and dad bought me the whole lot, you know, it's like wow. e everything. It was like I uh, sacrificed everything that I could do. And, and, you know, I got a job, you know, every job and every penny was recording time and buying instruments and stuff. And yeah, at school, they 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 were just like, you're deluded, you know. And, and they'd call you in for careers meetings and it's like, you can only be a musician if you're from London, you know. It's like, wow. um, and they'd fill out this stuff and they'd just be like, you know, rolling their eyes, you know, the careers teachers. Mm -hmm. And then they'd say in the end, it's like, you know, you, you, you've got to learn Welsh. And it's like, you know... I, I did get a similar thing, actually, because I left school and did a, a YTS. I don't know if you remember right. those. Yeah, I do, yeah. I'm old enough to remember those, yeah. Um, and that was at a, a little studio in Liverpool where we did electronics, did studio work, and then a bit of playing an instrument of your choice. Mm. And on the first day of that, they said, enjoy the two years because you'll never make a living at this. <laughs> yeah, I think that was... Yeah, I mean, that's yeah, kind, of, yeah. kind of how you, you know, set you up for life. I wonder if it's the opposite now, is that if you go to one of these Brit schools, you're being well, it's constantly told... It's a very serious profession now to yeah. get into music. Yeah, there's, no, there's none of us left, as the dub. I don't think so. Working no. class northern lads. Some that's very day, difficult yeah. to, uh, to come down and do but it. But also, and, uh, yeah. up there at that time... There was no expectation. It was just a dream. It was a dream. Yeah, but, but we're talking about this is what freaks me out being from Surrey is this is Liverpool we're talking about is the nearest city, which is Yeah, but you've got to understand there's mass unemployment. Mm. Just getting a job alone yeah. to earn a living was kind of the yeah. goal. Yeah. 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 So was... to actually do something you liked. Yeah. <laughs> there was two ways out, wasn't there? There was football and music. Yeah. yeah music. Yeah. Is there was there we talked about briefly there you piling as many ideas as that you'd had into what essentially became debut album so there's like loads of years of ideas was there a concept is there a concept that binds attack of the gray lantern together is there a lie motif um yeah, i mean yeah i mean obviously there's the story of it if any you know the fans will know the, the story of it or even, even though i don't know the story or even i've lost sight of it now but the <laughs> the, the original idea that i had was that, um, or as Spike would say, I was a, 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 
a kitchen sink merchant where you throw everything <laughs> into the mix, you know, and like to try and make it good, which is not a great thing because obviously some of the greatest rock and roll music has ever been made is very simple, and that's mm. the hardest thing to do, get a three-piece band, like we are talking about the police before or whatever, or, you yeah. know, these great bands who can, you know... Fish, bash, bush, yeah, yeah, put a few elements together and make some, a new sound, that's the hardest mm. thing to do. We weren't that, we were a studio project, so it was overdubbing and creating things, which, you mm. know, which is a skill and an art form in itself. I, we, I was, we were a recording artist more than, more than you know, like a you know, singer-songwriter or a band or anything like that. You know, it wasn't going to be Nirvana and it wasn't going to be the police or something like that, you know. So it had to be complex and it had to be based around what my skill set was, which was recording, overdubbing things, the understanding of Beatle records when I was a kid and mm. strumming and trying to come up with songs moving over the top. Chords of, around yeah, and moving chords around them, and moving yeah. melodies and the magic moment where the chord mm. tension hits the bit where the thing moves mm. and studying that and try. You know, you can never. You know, you can you just go forever and you can never <laughs> find it. You know, you know, and uh, the greats they can do it time and time again. The Abbas and the Beatles of the world. So yeah, f- for me it was okay. So it's got to be complex. Mm. So it's got to be drawn out. I think I wasn't massively confident of myself as a songwriter and stuff so I thought you know we'll, we'll have segues in there and you know okay, yeah. make it a little bit proggy you know but not too proggy because no way mm. we could get away with that that was a four and, letter word in those days yeah 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 and there's no there's no way we could have got ever gotten away with having even the idea of having a concept album you know it's just <laughs> dead in the Britpop era you know so I came up with the idea of doing a skit of a concept album okay. and a lot of my influences lyrically and stuff are like came from John Lennon and, and mm. I Am The Walrus I Am The Eggman and that come from the goon show and i mm. love monty pythons and a lot of it was comical and stuff so i had in my head right from the start that it was going to be a farce or like a musical farce like a you know mm. i like to think monty python think but some, across, yeah maybe. someone said like dick emery so yeah. you know <laughs> we'll go with that you know so so there's various elements and things and a, and a lot of thought and mechanics that i went in to try and get it in the ballpark and then i think i did an interview with select where they called me up and and, uh, they were interviewing me about the album. I said, yeah, it's not a proper concept album. It's just like a half of a concept Mm. album. Like, it's a con album, like trying to be dead clever (laughs) with the music press. Well, that was it, wasn't it? They just, like, followed me around for years and it was just like, oh, you know, God, go away, you (laughs) idiot. But I was trying to explain what it was. So over the years, I've now managed to hone down the description of it was and and I don't care that much anyway. You know, it's not rocket science or anything. Well, it's it's just a joke. Making a record is slightly daft anyway, isn't it? There's something quite silly about it anyway. Yeah, you've got to be completely deluded to even... even (laughs) like me and dub head out head out on our dream you know you've got to be completely deluded but you will never ever get to where we are here now sitting in this facility making records and and working on you know a catalog from the past and Mm. working on our current projects unless you start out and you are absolutely 100 percent into it can dedicate Mm. you know me and dub we had the same journey you know but playing in bands from very young and messing around with four tracks and you just never give up Mm. this 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 is the problem for you both of course if you are both into the beatles you're just aiming so high and it's never gonna it's never gonna match that. Yeah, yeah. But if you're Funny striving though, you're, you're, for that, you'll kind of accidentally. I don't come think across I was though, to be honest, because coming from Liverpool, all you ever hear about is the Beatles. <laughs> mm, yeah. Well, royalty, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so it, you almost kind of. And at that time, you got a lot of synth bands were sort of floating around in my teenage years. So I was quite influenced by mm. that, and that that's what yeah. excited me more. I don't want to belittle the Beatles because they were a bit no, of good. Course, of course we, were, we were just looking at your synth rack in there, Dub, before, yeah. which makes Howard Jones blush. Yeah. <laughs> Let's look at the characters at the time. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Keith Can you remember? Want, Keith definitely wouldn't want me to answer this question. <laughs> well, I think, I think the bass player... Yeah, just put then. The bass player Stove would just, uh, just approach me through some mutual friends and said, uh, you know, I hear you're getting a band together. I, mm. I've always wanted to learn a musical instrument. Um, hmm. The guitarist Chad worked in a bar in Chester, which was one of a few, like a little circuit of local bars that me and my circle of friends who weren't musicians, or oh, some of them were, would go into. But he was in a different band. Yeah, and Andy was the same, really. He was uh, he was very much ingrained in the the northwest music scene. We probably genuinely looked like we were just having a go. Yeah. Is that why there was this deliberate? And of course, it was fantastic as far as the Melody Maker and the NME, the music papers at the time, was concerned. This constant changing the visual image, loads of photographs with different outfits on. It was almost like again you were skitting the music industry. Here we yeah, are yeah, in no, boiler suits. Here yeah. we are in jeans. Yeah. I mean, if you well, just literally looking at this box set now, you can see the very 
first photographs of us. Mm. I can see this photograph. That is exactly what we wore on a day-to-day -day basis, walking around Liverpool or Chester or whatever. That is that is what we... Yeah, yeah that is us. Lads. That, yeah, a group, of, lads. A, group, a group of lads. However, it became... Th there, that's us. That yeah. is literally us. That's a real classic Britpop look. You're looking at a photograph of the five of you but there we, you with, know, we, with we, your we, bowl hairdos we, we, and we, jeans. Yeah, but that's what we were. What, what happened was, um, you know, we would turn up for a shoot at the Melody Maker and Tom Sheehan, who was oh, who, the him, legendary... Yeah. Yeah. Still Mature around, lensman, yeah, yeah, you know, and yeah. you know, I was, I was like, oh, you know, how'd you get in the melody? He's like, you got, you got to like ham up the photographs, yeah. and we saw super furry animals all sitting in yeah. like radiation tents or something like that, yeah. and we, and I just thought, you know, man, you know, yeah. let's throw do it. some shapes as she let's, used to let's, say, yeah. yeah so, so it's, I, I you said, and the very first thing uh, he said, if if you want a full page instead of the little thing, you yeah. know, give them what they want, yeah. I was like, why not, man? So it's like, go on then. So we turned up just in our normal gear and we did a photo shoot that Manson fans will remember where I'm lying in a road, mm. like going, ah, with mm, yeah. all my hair scruffed up. Yeah. And he was like, who would you really want to be? I was like, Johnny Rotten. You know, <laughs> I, I, I keep sounding like George Michael, but I want to be Johnny Rotten, you know. <laughs> so, you know, uh, that, that was the beginning of it. And mm. when I walked into the news agent, like, the next mm. week on the Wednesday, we had a full page in the Melody Maker yeah. with a little box in the front, and, and there, it was yeah. the photograph. What about the art school influence? Because you went to college, yeah. didn't you? And then you, presumably you were kind of um, trying to turn that into a, an art project. Yeah. And being told very much, no, it's not an art project. You're wasting our time, Mr Draper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I was literally marched out of the door in art college for wasting their time. <laughs> what a great tradition in rock music, um, that Yeah, I mean, I sat in with my assessment at the uh, end of my course and they just looked at me and just said, you're another failed musician abusing the art school system, <laughs> aren't you? And I, I just shrugged my shoulders. But they, and then they put me in the prospectus later on after Manson right, made really. it, yeah. So uh, the art school system was obviously, uh, you know, put into place after the um, uh, Second World War, if you like, to give people like myself the opportunity to get into the creative arts. And you mm. suddenly didn't have to be, you know, from a middle-class background in the mm. home counties to suddenly, you know work at the BBC or be a sculptor or something like that. And, and uh, blaggers like myself or John Lennon or Pete Townsend or Jarvis Cocker, who would, you know, all the thing I do is be a rock and roller, you know. So mm. how, how when you're, you know, when you've got that time and space at that seminal age to, you mm. know, hone your craft um, in the home counties, um, you know, or, or you've got your Tony Blair's thinking, oh, shall I be a rock star or prime minister? Mm. You don't have that choice where well, we come it's from. It's important, you know? I think, to understand the cultural side of pop music. Music, isn't it? I mean, that's yeah. The art school, I mean, yeah. The, without the art school system, there there would not have been the huge explosion of British um, rock music. John Lennon was a product of the art school system, mm. and it, not because of what it taught him. It gave him the space to become mm. who he was, and it, that's what it gave me. It gave me a breather. It gave me a little grant and a space to go to to hang out with some creative people. Some of the songs that became Manson were in, in, in my time at art school and the, the idea and the, the pomposity and the ridiculousness yeah, yeah. came from there, you know. And, and uh, But, of course, my drawings were crap, you know, same as John <laughs> Lennon's were crap, you know, and his poetry wasn't, you know. But, of course, then you suddenly you, you legitimise yourself by getting in a pop group and making yeah. it good. And, of course, do something creative instead of everyone just rolling their eyes at you saying, like, you know, <laughs> you can be a camera operator at HTV, mm. you know. So you've... We've got to the point where Manson is a is a signed act, is a studio act, as you say, first and foremost. How did you then recreate that live? You've now got to go on tour. How how on earth did you get to the point where you've got this sumptuous, crazy record and you've got to go out and play it on stage? I mean, it was virtually impossible. We started off with um, an Akai MPC drum machine loading up samples that kept breaking down and then putting power breakers on it and... In the end, I think it took when Andy joined the band early on and his power as a drummer, it's like, okay, the drummer can carry us okay. now. We're going to do 
punk rock interpretations mm. of these records. Because you played quite small places, you know, King Tut's Wah Wah Hut. Yeah, yeah, we, like, yeah, we played know. small places and then it suddenly, suddenly exploded into huge mm. theatres and then became a theatre act and toured around doing festivals and theatres for like, mm. you know, five years. Um, um, but yeah, we never really... Now, with the technology we got now, I went out and recreated Grey Lantern pretty accurately, you know, mm. but we didn't in them. We didn't then. We made. But what we did was we made it exciting and explosive. For all the personal issues that went on between people in the band and all this, that and the other, we all, we would always get together and have a, you know, one of them Madonna-like group, you know. Hugs before. Hugs, yeah, yeah and, and we gave ev- everything to every gig, I think, yeah, I barring think so. maybe, you know, one one or two little moments. But yeah. we... we, uh, we I don't think we ever shortchanged anyone. Yeah, I don't think no, we, we ever took t- a fan for granted. Yeah. Would you say that music has, in a way, caught up with what you were trying to do back then? Yeah, I, I, you know what ha- what happened with me? It dawned on me very quickly that if we just went down this route that we were going down, we would just be another band that was signed up, put through the mill mm. of the music industry, and their tactic is to throw a lot of crap at the wall and see what sticks, you know what I mean? And that is the, the way the music industry operates. So I just took the bull by the horns and said, OK, we've got to do something different. We have got to differentiate ourselves. That's where the, the, my conversations mm, with Tom mm, yeah. Sheehan come out and, and Tom really helped us develop visually. I think we went over the top in the end, but some of them, some of them we got... I don't think so. Some of, the, some of them were... Because yeah, you, you, you had to keep up now, with you know? Tom Sheehan as much as anything. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Tom was really yeah, creative. You know, I mean, he's a character. legendary guy, you know, and, and he, he gave us the confidence to not just sit around being a group of lads from the Northwest, you know. And um, yeah. Now, let's look at the box set. Finally, you both must be hugely proud of it. Yeah, I mean, the outtakes, we, me and Dub sat in here for days. Well, no, actually, I we... I thought that was Dub was, TV. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that, was, that was my... That, that, that M there on the... Second page in this square M, and mm. any super hardcore Manson fans will know that was my original logo. The original was it logo, really? Yeah, that's my original logo uh, yeah, for okay. Manson. Art, see all that art school training. Well, I thought he used it's rubbish. It's-